Hi, I'm Joshua Becker, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with Mike Vardy. Welcome to a productive conversation with Mike Vardy, and boy, am I glad to have Joshua Becker back on the program. It's been a while since I've had a chance to chat with him, and he's got a book out called Things That Matter. And, you know, when I've talked to people like Gretchen Rubin, and and, and I'll use her as a specific example, but there's a book, like her book, The Four Tendencies, to me seems like it's the seminal kind of work. I know she's got other books that have come out, and but that one is the one for me. And Joshua's had several books that have come out before, but this one, man, this is the book that I just, I just tore through it. I loved it. And we have a conversation about that book and other things that matter. And let's get to it. Here's my conversation and a very productive one at that with Joshua Becker. Joshua Becker, it is so great to have you back on the program. Oh, Mike. I like being on the program, but I just like talking with you even more. It has been too long. When have we last hung out? Too many years. Too many years. It was, it's got to be either Florida at Think Better. Was it Florida where we did Think Better, Live Better? Or was it San Diego when we saw each other at FinCon? One of those two. You're one of my favorite. You've been up here before. You're one of my favorite. I, I love chatting with you. You're one of my faves as well. And I have to say that when... The reason we're talking, and we're talking before this new book comes out, so just full disclosure to everybody, I saw the cover of your new book, and it was an absolute delight. It's an absolutely delightful cover. I loved it. The book is called Things That Matter, Overcoming Distraction to Pursue a More Meaningful Life. And this is a book, we were talking about this before I record, that I needed to read right now. Uh, before I move on to the next phase of what I, what I need to be doing. And that's the thing I think for you, right? Like you would love, like, I mean, for, for you, this book was something that you felt you needed to get out into the world. And I, I'm imagining that as an author, it's great to hear that this is the book that someone needed to read right now. Right. Yeah. It has been a, uh, a fascinating response, uh, when people hear the title and what the book is about, um, to hear them say, I need that book and I can't wait to read it. It really only happened when I, I self-published a book maybe eight or nine years ago called Clutter Free with Kids. And when I told people I was writing a book called Clutter Free with Kids, they all said the same thing. Oh, I need to read that book. And really the same response to this one, um, things that matter, overcoming distraction to pursue a more meaningful life. People have said, oh, that's the book I need to read. So you yeah, it feels good to feel like you are writing a book that um, people think that they need and want to read. And whether I surprise them with some of the directions in the book I take or not will be up to them. But i um, certainly glad to hear people are interested in it. So what I love about the book, other than the message, and I highlighted the heck out of it it's on my Kindle right now, is um, it wasn't the book. I mean, I know you well enough to know that this is this is a book I I. I when I read, I'm like, yeah, this is a book that Joshua had in him. But most people are going to think of you like, oh, you mean the minimalism guy? Like he's the guy that talks about minimalism. And yeah, you could argue that minimizing there is a minimiz- minimalization of distractions that you talk about in this book. But was was one of the reasons that you took so long to write the book is that you had this ident people had this identity, this perceived notion of who you who you were as a as a writer, as a creator, and that was one of the reasons. I know there's others that you talk about, but was that one of them that you think maybe? kept it from getting out of you and into the world? Um, I honestly, I don't ever think that was a specific one, at least not that I would have recognized at the time. Um, certainly I was known for minimalism in physical possessions specifically and had written those books. Um, when I would go do, I did a number of weekend retreats and I would always get to Sunday morning, the, the last of the weekend talks, and I would say, let's talk about how minimalism looks in a broader, a broader context to not just minimizing possessions, but minimizing all the distractions that keep us from a, a meaningful life. And I always loved giving that talk as much as I did the talk on the importance of owning fewer things. Um, and so I, I share in the book about how um, 
Charles Gilkey, uh, he asked a question. He said, if you were to die today, what is the one, one thing you would regret not completing? And uh, man, putting that talk into a book format um, was the first thing that came to my mind. And it was always topics that I had talked about, I had written about, I had blogged about, but I don't think I ever put together in this specific of a way. And looking back at that Sunday morning talk, I'm like, hey, here's the outline for the book. Like, how come I didn't make this connection before? So I don't know. I really wanted to write about money. Um, that was a book that I really wanted to write. Not how to budget better, but how money gets in the way of um, how money becomes our, our passion um, rather than making a difference in the world. And so I got to write about that in here and talk about possessions and a lot of other um, distractions, I think, that keep us from a meaningful life. All roads seem to have led to this book, though. Like, I mean, I've read all. Yeah. And I mean, there are there are touch points. We're not going to go through all eight distractions because, you know, number one, I want people to pick up the book. Number two, um, there are some people go, oh, right. Josh was talking about this. But but in the context of things that matter, I think the wrapping and when I say wrapping, I don't mean like shiny. I mean, it's just like the way it's brought together. And what one of the things that stood out to me <clears throat> as I was reading it, I'm looking about when you founded the Hope Effect, which, which you know, we'll link to in the show notes. It just goes to show how how precious time is and how time may be happening to us more than us happening to time. Because I didn't realize that as we're, it's been almost seven years as of this recording. And to me, it just seems like yesterday. And that leads me to the question about time and taking it for granted. I mean, I know you touch on some of this in the very beginning of the book about the idea of like what, you know, the idea of if I was to die, what would I regret? Um, how, in, in terms of the speed of time and the pace of life, uh, where does, how do we make sure that the things that matter, um, not only don't get lost in the shuffle, but that they get illuminated? Like what, what's one key thing that you found? And maybe there's a few that were like, you know what? My goodness, Mike, yes, it's been seven years since the hope effect. And it, yet it seems like it was a blink of an eye but yet there's other things that seem so far away, but were just yesterday. Like, how do we, how do we reconcile all that so that we make sure the things that matter don't get lost in the shuffle? Uh, I think it is a, um, a myth. Uh, I think it's a mistake to think that the things that are most important to us will always remain on the forefront of our mind um, because we live in a world that is filled with distractions. Uh, we live in a world where society, people, like there are certain things being chased and being pursued so much that it becomes normal. Um, and we, we very subtly, I think, begin to fall into the trap of chasing everything that everyone else is chasing rather than focusing our lives on the most important things. Um, and so how do we, how do we keep those things on the forefront of our mind is we have to be intentional about it. Like we need to sit down regularly. I mean, I, I would almost say, I don't know if every day is important, but certainly every day before I start my day, I write, I think of what are the three most important things that I want to accomplish in a day. Um, but we need to sit down regularly and, and just think, okay, what is, what is most important to me? Uh, what do I want to accomplish? What do I see as the purpose of my life for this given season? Because seasons of, the life, seasons of life change what's most important to us. Um, but to just think, hey, this is what's most important to me and all my resources are going to naturally align with it is, uh, is foolish thinking. It, it takes intentionality. Um, and consistency, and it takes it takes discipline and focus. So here's something that that caught my attention in the book about capturing things, getting things out of your head. This was something that like really stood out, and I want to hear some further insights on this because I've often said capture everything, regret nothing. Like get it out of your head, get it in front of you, so that it you can look at it and assess it. But there there's and this isn't you that's saying this. I just want to be clear. This is some guy named Socrates who said this. So he criticized writing things down by hand. So essentially capturing things because he believed it distracted people from pure thinking. Can we expand upon that a bit? Because I do think I've had 
thoughts about this, like getting it out of your head and then like l- assessing it properly. But I've had, you know, some people say, well, what if you, you know, we, we live in a world where it's like, I don't want to miss this. Like I'm at this Foo Fighters concert. I better take a picture of it. Or I'm at this baseball instead of being in the moment. So there's this weird dichotomy there that again, which I think and technology you bring up at the very end, which is very apt because it's a huge thing, but it's those instances, which maybe keep us from being in the moment and distract us from being fully present. But yet in some instances, it's important to get it out of your head so you don't lose sight of it, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's certainly a, a, a balance to it. I mean, there's a part where, um, I mean, I, I don't know anybody today who doesn't write things down. So, I mean, I don't think the, I don't think the temptation of, hey, I'm, I'm never going to write anything down is, you know, um, realistic for most people. And, and there is a, a, an extent to where if I'm working on something and um, something pops into my head that needs to be done, there's, there's an extent where if I know I write that down, it, it frees it from my mind so that I can, I can stay focused on the, uh, on the thing that's most important to me. Um, but I, I, I didn't use the, um, I couldn't quite find the, the exact source. And I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I once heard, like, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, but I, I haven't, every, every quote on the internet is attributed to Benjamin Franklin. So maybe it's not true. But uh, I remember him once saying that he doesn't, uh, I read once that he said that he doesn't write down all of his ideas because most of his ideas aren't very good. Um, and that the, the ideas that he has that really are good will come back to him. And I, I live a little bit that way where I can, especially in downtime, like I can get very busy and thinking about things that I could be doing or should be doing. Um, and just taking a step back and saying, you know what, not every idea is a good one. And so I, I tend to live my life a little bit down the road of Socrates where like, I don't have to write down everything that comes into my mind. The good ideas typically come back to me and uh, I can't quite shake them. Yeah, no. And I mean, it was funny. I was thinking about this the other day when I, I heard somebody on a podcast say about Alabama, the football team, they go, they don't rebuild, they reload. I'm like, Oh, that's a great phrase. Like that's, that's, I like that. And I'm like, but I was somewhere where I didn't, I can't remember what I was doing, but I'm like, well, I'm not going to capture that right now. I'm like, and my habit is to do that. But then oddly enough, another football reference um, was the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers who got eliminated from the playoffs. Bruce Arians said the same thing. Cause we're not going to rebuild. We're just going to reload. I'm like, Oh, there it is again. So sometimes it just serendipity, like it'll come back to you. And that, and I think that, that having both ways is having no way is bad. I think, <laughs> I think it's like, what do they say? It's like having no options is, is, is I've heard like having no choice is, is a problem. Having, two options is okay. Having three or more is a problem. So it's like, you have to find this Goldilocks thing. Um, the distraction piece. So we're not going to go over all of them because I want people to kind of get a sense of them. But the first one and the last one are the ones that, that got me, the, the, especially both, because I think those are the biggest. I, I honestly think like in the grand scheme of things that those are the two biggest areas of distraction that mess people up. The, the distraction of fear, which gets me a lot which keeps me from doing things that I know I'm capable of doing. Um, That's why I have the green lantern ring, man. That's why, I mean, you know, (laughs) the will willpower against fear is, but, and then the, the distraction of technology. I had no idea what it's a, is it a tychophobia or a tychophobia? I can't remember how it's pronounced. I, uh, I wrote it, but I'll let you pronounce it. (laughs) It's, I I haven't, I haven't narrated the book yet for the audio book, in which case I will. I will check a dozen resources to make sure I get it right. Right now, a tickophobia is the fear of failure. Like it's the fear of negative recourse, I think is really what it's rooted. I, it's interesting. We hear the phrase fear of failure, like, oh, fear of failure. But it's a, pho- like the phobia aspect of it never comes up. Why, why did you start with fear in the book? Like what was that? I mean, like I said, number one and number eight are the ones that, but why was fear the one that you felt like I need to address this first? So the book is about um, how to live a life with fewer regrets. And I think the way that we live our lives and we get to the end and we're proud of the life that we lived um, is that we live for meaningful pursuits. 
And the way we do that is we, we choose those pursuits well, and we eliminate distractions, and then we, we live for them um, every single day. Really, I think distractions come up every single day. And so um, the book covers eight different distractions. Uh, I conducted a nationwide survey. Mike, I did a nationwide survey. Can you believe it? I was going to get to that. It was nationwide. And, um, and, and part of it was I had my set of, hey, here's what I think are the distractions for people, but let's just see what people think and what people say. Um, and so some of the book came out of that. And um, there are two, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to phrase it other than there are um, two distractions that were a little bit separate from the others. So the pursuit of money and the pursuit of possessions and the pursuit of fame and uh, tech and, and those types of things. And then there was fear and past mistakes. And they kept, they kept coming up and they aren't things that, that we tend to pursue. Like we don't tend to pursue fear like we tend to pursue money or accolades necessarily. Um, but we just kept coming back to the fact that this is a thing that, that holds people back. Past mistakes, I think the numbers, we found out like 60% of people say that they are not reaching their fullest potential because of mistakes that they made in the past. Um, and another 60% who say because of mistakes committed against them are keeping them from fully reaching their fullest potential. So you seem to go hand in hand too. Yeah. Past mistakes. It's like they, they feed off of each other to a degree, right? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I found, again, as I was going through the book, some of the commonalities that we share was the idea of control, like giving up the schedule and like, this is what you value and the freedom and things like that. And it's amazing how the spiral begins, right? Like how it goes from here to here to here. All of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I'm catastrophizing without the need to. It, it, it's, it, it's as if, um, and you mentioned this, this message is throughout the book. Do it, living an intentional life is not easy. It's not, you've never said anything is easy in any of your work. You've never said this is going to be easy. You, you've talked about simplifying. You've talked about all that, but you've never said, you know what? This is going to be easy. It's, it's more about framing things in a way that makes people think about it. And I think that's where, I think that's one of the biggest things that get people stuck about things is they don't take time to think and stop and think how do distractions? I mean, what's interesting is I think the things that pull people away are those distractions, but they don't present themselves as distractions. And that's one thing that you come up with again, like this is a distraction. Oh, really? Yes, it is like the past mistakes part. Let's go there. Um, it's you, you, one of the phrases you have in the book is says move past the past, which I think is, I mean, it's amazing, but, but I often wonder about journaling and the role that journaling plays in that because reflection is important. So how do you navigate those waters when you're like, say you're looking at your journal and you're going like, I mean, I could tell you when I reviewed my year um, recently, I looked at my journaling app and I, it, it actually walks you through an annual review. First thing I noticed, Josh, was I was way harder on myself day to day than I should have been. Like I looked at my year and I'm like, wait a minute, I did great things. What the heck, man? Like yet, yet, yet we tend to go towards the negative. Um, how do, how do you reconcile the idea of reflection journaling, but also not getting trapped by the prison of the past when it's those past mistakes that are keeping you from doing the thing that you really should be doing? Yeah. Well, I think the whole idea of, um, journaling or the whole idea of moving past the past is that we we recognize that we can't change the past, but we can redeem the past by learning from it. Like those mistakes that we made can serve us, like they can teach us. They don't have to be just mistakes that cost us time or money or reputation, whatever it was, but they can be learning opportunities that we become a better person in the future. Um, and so for your journaling recap, your journaling review, like you can, you can look at that and you can say, hey, I'm harder on myself than I need to be. Like why? Well, number one, I would say like, what it, does this serve me? Like, does this serve me to be hard on myself? Is this does this push me forward or does it put me in a bad mood? Like, what can I learn 
from this that, that helps me become a better person? And what can I learn about this uh, in the way I talk to myself that, um, that needs to be changed? What's healthy, what's unhealthy? Um, and so, yeah, talking about mistakes and acknowledging them and noticing what they are. And certainly that journaling piece, um, I think is important. Um, I, certainly my blog, I always kind of consider my journal and what I'm learning and um, hoping that you can, you know, some lessons of life we need to learn more than once. So I think being able to go back and look at that is always helpful. Another thing that, that and I think this directly correlates to, is the idea of retirement. <clears throat> One thing you said is retool instead of retire. Talk about reload, rebuild. You said retool, retire. I think that's fantastic. I, I, I'm not going to ask you, are you ever going to retire, Joshua? Because you're not going to. The frame, that is a piece, if you, when you're going through the book, and I'm not going to tell you where it is. You have to read the book to get there because it's actually well-placed in the book when you're reading it. Um, I didn't realize that, well, first off, your grandfather, you dedicated the book to your grandfather, if I remember correctly, right? Um, can you quickly uh, just, uh, or even just go into a little bit of the story about like, you learned about what retirement was from your grandfather, right? Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, my grandfather died, um, 99 and a half years old. He died last December in the middle of me uh, writing the book. Uh, so much of the book, I, I credit to things that I, that I learned from him. Um, but uh, man, he... Uh, he worked 40 hours a week uh, up until um, three weeks before he died. Actually, in the hospital, on his deathbed, he was still working, uh, writing out a letter to, um, to, to people who were a part of uh, his organization. And, um, and I always learned from him, I think, just the, the, a different view of work than most people have, um, that when... When the goal of work, this whole idea of retirement, the whole idea is built on this assumption that the goal of work is to make enough money so that I can stop working. And it, 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 it paints the whole idea of work in a bad light. Like the whole goal of it is to stop doing it in the future. Uh, and I, I've just never... And not only that, like I talked to my mom about this. She goes, I work, I go, you were sold a bill of goods. You work all your life till you're 65. So you can do the things you ultimately want to do, but now you're not able to do it because you're too old. You're too tired to do this, to that. And I mean, I hate to, to, you know, belabor this, but you just lost two years because of a, of, of a pandemic and your percentage of life left compared to the percentage of my kids life left is much lower. So you're all, you're, you're now even more pissed off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that bill of goods is what happened, but keep, keep going because I, you know, the idea of work, as soon as I read that, I'm like, yeah. And, and it, it, it just lifted. It, it made me feel lighter. If I, so, so sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it was just like one of those things that it's just we, this idea of work is, Bass backwards. Yeah, and it's it's actually one of the reasons I like you so much. Uh, it's one of the reasons I like uh, Charlie so much. Um, just his idea of, hey, work is important. Uh, work is something that we should be giving ourselves to. It's not something that we should be trying to get out of, but it's something that we should be finding meaning in. Um, not if the whole goal of work is just to make money, like when the whole goal of work is just to make money, then, then we do have this unhealthy motivation and unhealthy selfishness that comes to work. But when we see work as love, when we see I do what I'm good at to benefit society so that other people can do what they're good at to benefit other people in society, then, then it becomes something where we're we're loving one another and we're giving to one another and we're serving to, serving one another um, through the work that I do rather than me just trying to build up a bank account or a, a bigger house or nicer vacations or getting out of work as soon as I possibly can. And it, it, changes, the whole, it changes the whole paradigm. And when, when work is the thing that I'm doing that is benefiting people in the world, then, then why would I stop doing that when I reach a certain age? It certainly is gonna look different, I suppose, when I'm older. Um, and depending on the work that you do, it might have to look different physically speaking, but it's not something where I'm just trying to, trying to get out of it. So there's a whole chapter on, um, actually, I believe the title of the chapter is Beaches Get Boring. Uh, and the, the whole, the whole um, chapter is on work and how this pursuit of leisure, this pursuit of checking out of work as the goal of life is, uh, I think, 
unproductive both for society and the individual. It's misguided too, because I mean, it, yeah. it, it devalues both. I think it devalues the work and it devalues the leisure time because what are you taking leisure from? Right? Like, I mean, there, I mean, we, <laughs> you could argue and get reductive that it's work hard, play hard. Okay. That's essentially to a degree what it is. Um, but w- what I don't like about that message is where it's been corrupt. There's been so many elements of productivity, even minimalism that has been corrupted and taken and repackaged. Um, before we wrap up, there is a point in the, in the, uh, in the book where you expand upon something that people have probably seen on Netflix and through, um, you know, the magic of tidying up and things like that. The idea of, does this spark joy? Um, the question that Marie Kondo asked, and I mean, you, you've, you've never really gone into those particular things before in your, in, in, in the work you've done in, in, in minimalism and the books you've written and, and the blog and all that stuff, at least to this degree. But the question this, I mean, that question is that you ask, and I'm going to let you reveal it is, is to me what makes this idea of simplifying your life, doing things that matter work. Can we talk a little bit about that before we wrap up? Yeah. Uh, I, I go, I, I don't know how familiar your um, listeners are with me or the work that I do, but this, uh, this book, I, uh, I reveal a lot of stuff about me that I haven't um, necessarily revealed in, in other books and, and, <laughs> and yeah, get into, get in a little more personal stuff, but I, the the book needed it. I mean, the the book, I don't know. I mean, it's as much about my own personal journey um, through these things as uh, as it is to others. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, there's um, Marie Kondo. Well, first off, let me say, uh, I, I forget if it's exactly in the book or not this way or not, but I am for anybody who helps people own less stuff. Like I know there are different ways to do it. There's different approaches. There's different philosophies. There's different ways to do it. Uh, and I'm, I'm all for that. I've always, um, uh, I don't know, um, not loved the, the very famous Marie Kondo question of does it spark joy? That this is how I decide if I'm going to keep something or not. Uh, and the first time I heard it, I thought to myself, well, most people bought the thing because it sparked joy in them in the store. Like there's a, there's a level where holding a thing brand new, we, we tend to love it and like it. And so I, I think it tends to lead to over consumerism in the first place. But for me, uh, for me, minimalism has always been about, uh, removing distractions so that I can focus on the things that matter most. Uh, it's never been about, I want to check out of life. I want to live a lazy life. I, I don't want to do anything at all. So I'm going to become a minimalist. For me, minimalism has been I'm going to own fewer possessions so that I can accomplish bigger things with my life because our lives are just too valuable to waste chasing and accumulating material possessions. So I want to free up money, time, and energy so that I can accomplish the most with the one life that I've been given to live. Um, And so then that always framed how I viewed minimalism, how I write about it, and how I pursued it. The question isn't, I just want to own the things that make me happy or I just want to own the things that spark joy, but I want to own the things that allow me to serve my purpose. What are the things that help me accomplish those things that matter in my life? Um, and there's a, there's a piece where, I mean, there's a part where, hey, a, a piece of art on the wall, you know, inspires me or it, it brings me calm. It brings me peace. It helps me refocus. Like it allows me to accomplish my purposes better and pursue my values more. Um, and so using that as the framework, using that as the question um, um, concerning the, the things that we keep, um, material possessions specifically. Um, Joshua, this has been great. I wanna say um, as we wrap up that the book is called Things That Matter. And this book is one that matters. I'm so glad you wrote it. I'm so glad that you went to that seminar so glad that you, Charlie, gosh, you can, we got archives with Charlie on the show too. And by the way, we're not going to, I mean, we can go into the technology piece, but I've had Cal on the show before you allude to Cal a few times in here as well, but the book, you, you, the way you frame this, I mean, this is a book that matters. So when, when someone says don't judge a book by its cover, 
You can absolutely <laughs> judge this book by its cover because the cover is absolutely gorgeous as well. Um, Joshua, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Where can people pick up the book and keep up with the work that you do? Uh, the book is available uh, April 19th, um, and it should be available anywhere and everywhere. Um, I don't know if it'll be available in all the different Language translations quite yet, but uh, certainly should be uh, all available, certainly on uh, your local Amazon and Barnes and Noble and um, should be in most bookstores uh, anywhere. And if they don't have it, um, certainly they'll get it for you. So thanks for that. And becomingminimalist.com is uh, my home space and uh, certainly all the information will be there as well. Thanks, uh, Josh, for uh, coming on and having a productive conversation. Oh, it's good, man. Nice to see you. You need to pick up this book. If you are going to read any book this month, Things That Matter needs to be the book that you pick up. It is available anywhere books are sold. And everything else that Joshua and I talked about, including where you can get the book, you can find at productivityist.com slash podcast 418. That's where all the show notes are. And you can also just click on them in the podcast app you're using right now, but you can also do other things in that podcast app, which is subscribe to the podcast. That way you don't miss a single episode of what's to come. The next episode, I'm joined by Adrian Smith. That's going to be another great episode. I'm looking forward to that one as well. By the way, if you want to help the podcast out, support it, keep this show going strong. Subscribing is one thing you can do. Rating and reviewing is another thing you can do, but checking out our sponsors, that's a big way that you can help. So go to productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors, and you can help support the podcast by visiting the sponsors that you heard during this episode. That's it for now. And that's it for this episode. Until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. I'll see you later.